All right, everyone. It is my honor to introduce Sammy, who is a longtime friend of Torcon, who will be speaking about bypassing that. Without further ado, Sammy. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, so carry this. Hello. Okay. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Um, I hope I hope I'll start. I hope you'll forgive me. I'm a little under the weather, uh, but I am excited to be here and a lot of great stuff to share with you guys. Uh, we're going to talk about nat pinning, and I realize I have a lot of information here, so we're, we'll zoom through a little. Happy to do Q and A after, um, but first let's talk about what is nat network address translation. Uh, most of us have routers at home. I mean, most of our networks at home probably look kind of like this, where you basically have. Uh, the idea of NAT is that we're essentially running out of IPv4 space, and IPv6 is coming, so that, that's what they tell us. Um, any time now, any day now. And the idea of NAT is that because we're running out of IPv4 space, or public IPs, what we can do is we can essentially have our router here, and that can give us internal address space, so a 10 dot network or 192 network that is not actually routable on the public internet. However, we can have multiple devices all sharing a public IP address that then reaches the internet. And the idea of um, NAT pinning. And actually, one of the benefits of routers is that they essentially act as a firewall. So uh, they will essentially, if you have a bunch of services running on your machine and someone tries to, say, connect to your machine from outside from the public internet, they can't because your router is blocking it. Because your router needs to know who is this supposed to go to unless you have port forwarding or DMZ or some, some sort of feature enabled. Now, why is this a big deal? Um, I ran LSOF on my machine a couple days ago and this is what came up. Uh, all of these services are listening on essentially public, on my public uh, network device. So that means, I don't know, I have node servers running. I don't know why node is running. I don't know why node is running. Uh, Crash plan is my backup service. Sonos, I don't even have a Sonos. Yet Sonos is listening on my computer and is listening to like, has an open service. Why is that, po why is that happening? So many of, these, many of these tools are gonna have vulnerabilities in them. So it's always interesting to see if we can attack those, um, those services. So the idea of NAT pinning is something I demonstrated maybe nine or 10 years ago, uh, and that was a very pr uh, basic proof of concept, where essentially a, a victim would go and visit a website on the internet, a malicious website, and that website would send some data through, back, to the, back to the user, the user would execute some code on their web browser, and then open up um, uh, essentially a port on their router. Now, the way that essentially happened is through something called connection tracking. Now, connection tracking is something um, we may have seen with FTP. Uh, FTP is a good example. Uh, many of you have used FTP. Hopefully, no one uses it anymore. Um, FTP allows you to transfer files. So you can FTP to a uh, FTP server, and you'll say, hey, I want to receive this file. But the way that happens is that it actually uses a second port. What your FTP client does is it opens a secondary port, and, your F and the FTP server will connect to that port. The problem is, when routers came out, that broke. Because now your router says, I don't know what this port 1234 is, so why would I connect to this? So routers then introduce something called connection tracking or an application level gateway. An applicant ALG will say, oh, I'm a router, I see someone internally on my internal network wants to do an FTP, and they said, oh, connect back on port 123, so I will open port 123 for them. So initially, and when I'm looking into how a protocol works, uh, the first thing I do is read the RFC. Now RFCs are essentially how protocols are, are built, but it doesn't necessarily mean protocols are built this way, but it's a good foundation to base things off of. In 2010, when I was initially demonstrating how this, um, how this technique worked, uh, essentially I tried FTP, I was trying, uh, I found that the browsers had various restricted ports, so I actually couldn't connect to FTP, and IRC was another tool that I wanted to use. Uh, let's see here, excuse me. Oh, so what I wanted to do was essentially act as an IRC client. The nice thing about IRC is that it's similar to HTTP in that it's a new line based protocol. When you're on HTTP and you reach a web server, you say I want to get slash HTTP 1.0, you know, uh, carriage return, new line. All of these are new line based. And IRC is also another new line based protocol, just like FTP. And IRC has something similar to, AL, to FTP where you can say, hey, I'm going to DCC chat you. I'm going to DCC send you a file and you're going to connect back to me on this port. And your router, again, has an ALG for IRC, DCC. So your router sees that message and is going to open up the port and then port forward back to you if you're using an IRC client to send this DCC message. So I was thinking, couldn't I just create a web form 
that connects to an IRC server, but is really a, is just a random server on the internet on the IRC port 6667. And then we say, I want to send a DCC, because you can force someone's web browser to submit a form. Uh, and you can make him do that to any port, except for the fact that browsers restrict ports. An interesting way around that is back in 2010, what you could do is you can essentially have uh, TCP ports and UDP ports are 16 bits wide, 65,535 possibilities, 36 possibilities. However, the browser itself is dealing with strings. So if you added one bit, let's say you created a 17-bit port, and essentially the highest bit was a one, you now have a port that's much larger than, that's much, that's larger than six, 16 bits. Um, however, what would happen is your browser would say, is this a restricted port? No, I don't know this port, whatever port number it is. In this case, it is, uh, I don't think I have it written down here, um, but 65, <laughs> let's say I want to connect to port 6667. If you had 65536 plus 6667, you have some much bigger number. And your browser will then see that and say, oh, that's not in my restricted port list. Then it will send it on to the TCP IP stack, which only is going to take a 16-bit 16 16-bit 16 number, and you just bypass the restriction, the port restriction. So you can now connect out to any restricted port on the user's browser. And this is essentially what, the, uh, what an IRC connection would typically look like. So what your browser is actually sending is we take all of this data and this message, uh, and like a DCC message, and put it in the post body. And it will post something. And, your, and ultimately, um, your router will see that and then open a port back. And I'll be happy to share the slides. Um, this is the example code that actually performs this full attack and would actually do this and would open up essentially any arbitrary TCP port. Uh, now, one thing is when I tried this, it actually didn't work. And part of the reason is that the way for this to work is that DCC and FTP, they both require you to know the internal IP address. So when you're saying, hey, connect back to me, you're also including the IP, your IP address, your local IP address. And typically, a browser doesn't know your local IP address. Now, in 2010, there was a technology called Live Connect. Has anyone used Live Connect? I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad to see no <laughs> This was Java embedded into the browser, accessible via JavaScript, and you could do some really wacky things. Um, it was really useful for me because it allowed me to access your internal IP. It went away very quickly. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, so this was the Live Connect code that would essentially allow you to access your local IP address. So it was built into a couple of browsers briefly as a beta and then quickly went away. Um, here's the actual full code of uh, performing this attack back in 2010. Now, they fixed the port restriction, they've removed Live Connect, so none of this stuff works today. And this has always been kind of interesting to me, so I've tried to just play with this over, over time. Our overflow technique also no longer works. So recently I've been looking at what are other services that, um, that are multi-protocol, right? Something that an ALG would actually look at. And I made a, a spreadsheet here. Um, I went through the Linux, uh, Linux TCF, TCP IP stack um, and just collected all the different ports and services and what protocol they needed to be on. And I wanted to find, and then I took a list of Chrome restricted ports. Um, we see what Chrome blocks. And the ones that they don't block are uh, SANE, which is a backup protocol that nobody uses, SIP, um, uh, PPTP, H323, which is voice over IP. And SIP was pretty interesting. So I started taking a look at SIP. If you're not familiar with SIP, um, it's like, uh, it's like FTP, but for noise, it's a voice over IP protocol. So it says you can make a connection on UDP or TCP port 5060 to some server, and you say, hey, I want to make a call, I want to invite, and then you can, and then on a secondary channel, you'll then send audio, and you can create additional channels for video. So I was thinking, okay, couldn't I reproduce that same technique, this nap pending technique with SIP, because this also supports TCP. Um, 5060 is not blocked based off the, the Chrome restriction list, so that's pretty cool. Maybe we can do that. So I attempted to do this via an HTTP post. I made a website. It has a hidden form. It auto-submits via JavaScript to a server that I'm running on port 5060 with the SIP, with the SIP packet in the, uh, TCP, in the port post section. Unfortunately, this failed because, again, I don't know the IP address. So we actually need to know what the IP is. Uh, so I found a pretty cool thing that would allow me to uh, grab your local IP address, and that was Stun. Essentially, now new browsers have WebRTC, which allow you to perform voice over IP with other people on the internet. And partially, 
you need to actually know the local IP address. So I was very excited when I found that you can actually use Stun and ICE to get the user's local IP address. This was really cool. Um, unfortunately, a couple weeks ago when I was working on this presentation for you guys, um, it stopped working. And that's because people realized it's a bad idea to actually show the local IP address. So all the browsers stopped doing this. And then instead, they replace it. Instead, it's no longer a local IP address, but rather it's a Bonjour or MDNS uh, host name that doesn't resolve except internally on your network. So this all broke. Thank you. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> uh, so this is an example of what it would actually look like. Um, this was what it ended up being. So I furiously had to find an alternate solution uh, since this no longer worked because you can't use that dot .local IP address because when your ALG sees it, your router sees it, it's, not, it's gonna say, I don't know what that is. Um, and then here's a, here's a video where we'll see, uh, we're gonna do a TCP dump from my laptop and then we're gonna go from a, a server. I'm behind a router in there. And then we'll just see, oh, we'll do netcat. That's what we're doing, okay. And we'll see something interesting here. When you connect to a service that isn't running, we see an immediately connection refused. And that's because TCP is sending an RST back to us because there's an IP stack that's living. And when there's, when we connect to a service that is there, like port 80, then we get a SYNAC back saying, hey, I'm here and I want to connect with you. Now, if we connect to an IP address that does not exist, we get nothing back. So can we use this information to help us gain an IP address? So what we can actually do is a TCP timing attack within the web browser. What if you create an image and your image connects to a random IP, let's say a, a router IP, like 192.168.0.1. Now you don't know the victim's router IP, but we do know there's probably a handful, maybe 20 IPs that are pretty common uh, within routers as their gateway IP. And what if we do, uh, we create an image and then we have an on load and an on error event. Now if there is a machine there, it's either going to be listening on say port 80 or it's not gonna be listening. If it's listening and it's on port 80 and the image exists, we're, that's gonna fire an on success event. Um, if it's not listening, but that's going to fire an RST, which will fire an on error event. Um, if there's nothing there, an on error will happen, but it'll happen after a few seconds. So what if we just time that amount of time from when we drop this image to when we get an on success or on error? And we don't care if there's something listening or not. We just want to know, is there a machine there? And we do this for, say, the top 50 possible routers. And now we know what the gateway IP address of your LAN is. So now we've just discovered by trying 192.168.0.1.1.1.2.1, so, so on and so forth. We tried all the 10, 10 dots, and then we figure out what your gateway IP address is. Now, we still don't know your IP. We need to know that. So then we perform the same attack, but for your subnet. And we're doing this now for every IP within your subnet and timing all of them. Well, which machine is going to respond the fastest? It's your own machine, right? Because your own, your own machine doesn't need to respond, doesn't need to go through the router, so it's going to immediately respond. And you can now determine a local IP address. So this is an example. Um, this is entirely automated where you visit a site, it detects what subnet you are by testing, uh, it's actually, I probably test 300 different, uh, 300 different um, routers. And then whichever one is fastest, then we try all the IPs in that subnet. And then ultimately we, we see that we do get the local IP address. So that is pretty cool. We now know the local IP address of the user. And this still works. This still works. So no about that. Unfortunately, I then tried that. I took this, a local IP address, I put it in the SIP packet, and then uh, still didn't work. So why does it fail? So I think we need to really understand how does a router ALG work. Um, so the first thing we want to do is we want to dump firmware uh, if we want to really understand, right? You take your router, you open it up, and you potentially dump firmware. Um, just some of the tools that I like to use, uh, that's strange. This is the wrong image. <laughs> Sorry about that. <clears throat> That's better. That's better. OK. Um, so I like to actually use my phone whenever I'm investigating hardware, right? If I'm looking at hardware, uh, A, I like to take pictures with it, right? I can take big pictures. You can zoom in. Um, you can use the flashlight to often look through a PCB to follow traces. It's very useful if you put it on the bottom of a circuit board. That will help you find things. Um, you should be looking at the names of all the chips on here. So if you open up your router, you can look at all, all the chips, look at the names, find the data sheets. Many, almost all of these will have, well, many of these will have public data sheets. Uh, if I'm trying to dump firmware or attack a chip some other way, uh, microprobes are super useful. Um, 
Logic Analyzer is super useful. If you're glitching, uh, uh, tools like Chip Whisper um, from Colin O'Flynn, super useful. And then also going online, looking for binaries. Uh, if you can find binaries or you can extract from, or you extract it from the device itself, then using a tool like Binwalk, which will actually find different, uh, it will look for different binaries and file types within a larger image. So it'll say, oh, you have an LZMA or you have a SquashFS uh, file system here. And then once you know that, you can use binwalk-e or you can use a separate tool like unsquashfs to extract that and then access the files inside. Once you have access to the files inside, then you want to kind of look around. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So I was looking around um, to see, all right, I know my router does FTP and SIP, so let me just look around the file system and see what does it do with FTP? Um, and what does it do with SIP? Because my SIP, the technique that I think should work, I know voice over IP calls works, so my router clearly has ALG enabled. Yet when I attempt my attack from the browser, it no longer works. So what's going on here? So I did an unsquash FS, um, pulled out the file system, went through, looked for different FTP files, uh, I have a bunch of different tools I'm using. Uh, I've also linked to all of them in the bottom right here, so I can make this, uh, this tool, of this, spread, uh, this presentation available, excuse me. Um, and I also wanted to start using this tool called Jidra, Gidra, does anybody know how it's pronounced? Gidra? Gidra? How do you know? Do you work? <laughs> oh, no, I'm just, I'm not, are you with the NSA? Somebody told me. Somebody, oh, somebody told you. <laughs> <clears throat> and I love that when uh, Gidra, Gidra, excuse, this tool, when this tool came out, uh, the NSA released this reverse engineering tool. And it was around the same week that Microsoft saw this was like, oh, we're going to open source calculator <laughs> in response. So calculator came out as open source as well, which is pretty cool. So uh, with G Gidra, Gidra, am I pronouncing it right? I apologize for... Ghidra, okay, my head is like, it's not great right now. Uh, I apologize. So in, in Ghidra, uh, we're taking a look at one of the files that matched FTP. Just the word FTP, that was a, it was a kernel object, a .ko. So I was like, oh, there's gonna be some cool stuff in there. And we start taking a look. And then I'm like, okay, we, we, what other decodes are there? What other ALGs does this router support? And of course we found SIP decode. So now we're looking around for SIP decode to see how does SIP decode work? Under what conditions will my router say, oh, this is a SIP packet versus this is someone just doing whatever, random other traffic? And interestingly, we see something here where it's doing an invite. Uh, in my SIP example, I was doing an invite or a register. Um, and here it's actually doing a string, string end, case, end case compare. And what's interesting about this is that the invite or the register must be at the beginning of the data portion of the packet. So now in a TCP packet, if you're sending, if you're doing this, uh, weird thing through um, HTTP post, your packet is actually gonna begin with a post slash HTTP 1.0, host, whatever host, user agent, whatever, and then the post data. So unfortunately, I can't control the beginning of the packet. Um, that's the browser. The browser has full control of the beginning of the packet. I only have control of the middle of the packet, which is the post data. So I'm thinking, okay, what else can we do? How can I look, how can I maybe perform some sort of raw socket within the web browser. So I started taking a look at Chrome uh, flags and experiments. Um, it's always interesting to see what are the new protocols that are supported going through that stuff. Uh, what features does it have? Um, and looking at sockets, uh, here's the Chrome source code going through here. I was going through the W3 uh, website and then I found this page when I was trying to like understand a protocol and it's like, what is topic? Explanation. What is topic used for? Explanation. There's not much explanation there, but most of their documentation actually is really good. Uh, after going through, I found some protocols that my browser supports, which is HTTP, HTTPS, FTP, FTP WebSocket, DNS, um, Spidey, Stun, Ice, a couple others. Nothing that really allowed me to control the very beginning of the packet, which is what I need to pro pro potentially perform this attack. Um, but then I was looking at UDP Stun and I was playing around with that because uh, the Stun, Turn, and Ice, those are all used to un understand what kind of NAT you're using so that WebRTC can then properly perform voice over IP and video, uh, video communication. And I started playing with, the, with Stun, and I found that I can actually set a username for a packet um, for, to auth authorize that Stun connection. And that username can actually be as long as I want. So you can kind of do, you can just send really, really, really long packets in UDP. Now what's interesting about this is that ultimately you have a limit of how long a packet is, but the browser itself didn't limit it. So that means it's your IP stack now limiting it. 
when your IP stack limits it, in this scenario for UDP, it then does IP fragmentation. So once you're over the boundary of the first packet, it then creates a secondary packet where you now control the beginning of that packet. So you actually, as long as you know what the size of that packet is, which you can do in a test case, you can now do essentially arbitrary UDP packet injection on the second packet. That's pretty cool. Um, the only problem with, AL, with ALG is that for ALG, when it sees a SIP UDP packet, it will only allow you to then open a UDP port. And UDP ports are fun, but I'm really more interested in TCP ports. That's where all the juicy services are running. Um, so we now actually have the ability to do UDP uh, packet injection, and this, this technique worked for UDP. But the problem is I need to do this for TCP. So what if we just send a really, really, really long form? Uh, this is an actual post from my, uh, from my Chrome web browser. So I just sent a post. I bolded the parts that I control, right? So I control this, uh, the, the slash, whatever, the URL. Um, I control the cookie, and then I control the form, uh, the form data itself. So I just sent a ton of data, and I somehow Photoshopped a weird thing there. I don't know why. Um, and then I sent my SIP packet. Uh, in this case, it's a register packet. And what's really interesting is that you can do, perform the same exact attack. So what you do is you create a really, really long packet, and you are listening on the other side on port 5060 on TCP now. And on TCP, you get this packet, and then you see where does it break up. And you can actually kind of control where it breaks up, because TCP has a feature called MTU sizes. Where you, uh, I'm sorry, that's Ethernet. Ethernet has MTU sizes. You want a, you want a smaller MTU, but TCP has, um, oh man, what, MSS? Yeah, uh, was it me message segment size, segmentation? Ma maximum segment size, thank you. So you could, when you're actually receiving a TCP SYN from someone, you can then respond with an MSS in the options and say, I will only accept packets of this size. And then you already know the size of the packets that the br browser is going to send. Um, I did find that some browsers, uh, specifically Firefox and one other one, would alter the width of this uh, WebKit form boundary, which is the boundary of the post data for, for this specific form. Um, it would only do it by a few bytes. So I found that intermittently this would not work. You would not know the proper size. And what you can do is all you do is you listen on the other size, on the other side, and you say, oh, that was off by one byte. Send that data back to the browser over a WebSocket. Tell them, hey, you were one byte off, try again. And you do this feedback loop, and within five tries, you then have a, you then send this post, this extra data, and you create a new TCP packet, essentially with full arbitrary TCP control of the data portion. Um, ultimately, this allowed me to Reperform the same exact attack, and you now have entire arbitrary TCP and UDP packet injection control within your uh, browser, which reallowed the attack, which also means you can then open up any TCP or UDP port on that victim just by them visiting a website. You can then connect back to any service that they're running, um, which is pretty cool. And uh, I think that's it. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Um, uh, yeah, do we have any, I think it's an example of like connecting to a MySQL server that's on my computer. So it's an entirely automated. Um, I'd be happy to share any details or uh, answer any other any questions. Uh, yeah, cool. We have a minute and fifty seconds. Any questions? Yes. Have you tested on VPN providers and their implementation of that? Oh, uh, that's really interesting. I don't think it would work on a VPN provider. Um, because, A, I don't think I'm even gonna get their IP address. Uh, I don't know, maybe, I'm not sure. That's, that's a good question. Anyone know? It's a different kind of implementation. Yeah. I don't know if they're doing ALG. I wonder if they are, I'm not sure. Yeah, that'd be interesting to see. Yes? Really fantastic, John. I, I think that's what's interesting to me is that I don't think it's a bug, right? This is just, right? It, all you're doing is you're abusing multiple protocols, right? You're telling your browser to behave like a SIP client, and your router sees a SIP, what appears to be a SIP client talking on the SIP port with a valid SIP packet. Um, everything looks correct. So I don't, I don't consider this a bug, right? I consider this just an abuse of multiple protocols. Um, so uh, no one's at fault. <laughs> <laughs> Yes? How would you patch this? Um, 
you can do it multiple ways. I mean, on the ALG, like browsers are probably just going to keep on closing ports. I don't think that's a, that's the correct that's the real solution. I don't necessarily think it's the browser's issue either. Uh, I don't know. You could have a more strict ALG on your router that says, "Oh, I shouldn't like." I I don't know, man. That's tough because you don't you don't want to drop an ALG just because someone sent an invalid packet. Because if if there's an update to a protocol and your router didn't get that didn't get that update, and now you see an incorrect um, packet, like, I don't think you should drop all ALG support. So I, I honestly don't know the answer. I haven't really thought about it. No. Okay, thank you so much, everyone. If anyone has any further questions, Sammy will be outside in the patio. And this is the last reminder, if you are doing skydiving tomorrow, to go to registration basically right now and sign up for that. Yeah. <laughs>